Hello, everybody. I want to wish everybody a happy Mother's Day to all the Afro-Latinas in the world. Happy Mother's Day to all. Um, we have Sherry here once again. Hey, Sherry. Hi. Okay, so um, me and Sherry were talking about um, an important subject about um, fruits and vegetables from Africa, right? Yes. Um, so in the slave uh, industry, they would bring in fruits and vegetables from Africa to other lands? Yes, they were. Um, well, the Spanish were the main ones that brought the slaves from Africa as well as the Portuguese, um, like in Latin America, that is. But during one, the Spanish brought things like watermelons with them on board because it kept them hydrated aboard the ships. So that's how watermelons actually ended up in the Americas. Watermelons didn't mold like berries and they could survive and hydrate people when you didn't have fresh water. Um, and they also grew really well in clay soil that's really in like the worst climate. Um, watermelons are native to West Africa specifically since prehistoric times. Um, in ancient African civilizations like Egypt and the Kushite Empire, watermelons have been found in tombs. Um, so there's deep roots with watermelon. Nowadays, you can also find different varieties like um, the yellow watermelons in Harris Teeter. Um, but things, also slaves brought seeds themselves. Somehow they were able to carry seeds in their hair or in their clothes aboard the ships. And they brought things like bene seeds, which are the West African word for um, the sesame seeds. And how the slaves would hide these seeds, they would, um, on these plantations, plant them in between the crops um, that the plantation owners had. They would hide their gardens in like a hidden garden so that they were able to have their nutrients because the nutrients and things that the slave owners were giving them were scraps, like they weren't high quality foods. And also their foods were a way to keep their um, culture and their traditions alive. Um, so yeah, they, that's how they had their gardens. They weren't given a little plot to grow their own, so they would just hide them in between the, like tobacco or cotton, things like that. So what did they bring um, from Africa, um, from like other countries that, for example, we, we were talking about India, we were talking about Europe in itself, um, how they brought um, the, the seeds from Africa to the States. So things that like what people are familiar with are like okra. Okra is definitely West African. Like there's most people that have heard of okra. Um, okra helps prevent diabetes. Um, there's been a lot of case studies on that. Um, so that plant is resistant to drought as well. Um, West Africa, part of West Africa is sub-Saharan, which is very desert-like. And the other parts are more like savanna. It's a, and then there's another end that has like actual jungle. Um, so it's a very diverse climate that's very hot, um, so which is good for Latin America. Latin America is like a moist, hot climate. Um, so you want plants that are adaptable. Um, other things that they brought over were black eyed peas, um, gilo. Some Brazilians are familiar with gilo, which is a type of eggplant that is very specific to Africa. There's different types of eggplants. Um, Asians have their own eggplants, but the most amount of eggplants and sesame varieties in the world are in Africa. Um, so the scarlet eggplant, gilo, um, there's a white eggplant that's like oval shape that is also from Africa. There's tons of varieties. Um, sesame is really good for depression. Um, it's really good for weight loss. It actually ups your melanin content in your skin to make it darker to prevent you from sunburning. Wow. And it's been used since Mesopotamian times. It's called the spice of happiness. Um, so a lot of like um, Africans would mix olive oil that they got from the Spanish with sesame oil. Um, that's a West African technique. And also um, Africans from North Africa had olives. And the olives of North Africa are called war, war era olives. I'm probably butchering the way I'm saying it, but it's spelled um, W O. I R A. Um, Africans also were very much a rice based culture, which you know, Latin America, we like our beans and rice. Like, there's like <laughs> really places you go to. 
Um, so that's a thing um, that was like a crossover because Native Americans in Brazil had rice, a very specific species, which is now endangered. And Africans had their own West African variety of rice. And Madagascar also had their rice, um, which was brought to the New World. Um, so rice was a big thing. Millet was a huge thing for West Africa. West Africans were not big into wheat because wheat is a Middle Eastern thing. You find more like North Africans had wheat. Um, so things of West Africa were more like flatbreads, fritters, like banana puff fritters, which are similar similar to bonelos. I'm probably butchering that. Sorry, guys. Um, but you know, the puff pastries that you fry in yeah. Latin America, those look almost identical. Anyone can look this up to Akira, which is from West Africa and specifically Nigeria and Sierra Leone, which um, they have a savory variety that's mixed with like um, black eyed peas and rice flour and another one that's mixed with rice flour and smushed bananas that they fry. Nice. Really good stuff. I've made it myself. It looks like the sweet one looks like an eclair. Um, and you can carry it in a Ziploc bag hiking. So, and it's gluten-free. So like a lot of West African stuff is, um, is gluten-free naturally. Um, you do have sorghum. A lot of people have heard of, heard of sorghum molasses. Um, in the, if you're from the Southeast, it's some of that older molasses. Um, in West Africa, I think they call it, um, pea grain or something that's different um guinea pea or something but it's sorghum and that's a grain that you will find in central and south america as well because it would stand withstood like tropical environments and that's from tropical africa mostly um so there's many different crops are indigos which are non-edible we brought over here as well um i'm trying to think of some other ones that we brought over um sorry just trying to think of off the top of my head um there's just like a diverse range as you know horchata horchata has been debated on whether it came from the middle east or africa what we do know is that tiger nuts um are native to west africa like in nigeria mm -hmm. all the way up into spain like southern europe and in the middle east right. people that horchata originated out of Africa, though, okay. um, and came to Spain via um, via Morocco. And tiger nuts, or chufa, as it's called in Nigeria, um, grows underground. And it's like they're like little balls. They're kind of similar to our peanuts in that concept that they grow underground. Um, but they taste like an almond, which makes sense because the original Spanish horchata was like with tiger nuts and rice. And right. later became almonds and rice. And then like in places like Cuba, it was the sea almonds, the false almonds with rice. Um, so that's how like you saw it um, evolve in the new world. Um, people just made do with what they had. As it got to the new world, it was more like rice based and less like tiger nuts because they didn't have tiger nuts in Latin America. So they tried to use like sea almonds and things like that. Um, so that's how you saw like the, but tiger nuts, have tons and tons they're considered a superfood and they grow in desert climate um in straight clay so that's another thing is like african varieties of foods are very tough like they withstand heat just like the people they're resilient um and they're packed with ingredients um baobab some people might have heard of that fruit um there's been rumors that some people brought those trees back um, just like Aki, if you're Jamaican, probably heard of Aki. Um, that's another West African one. It's a vegetable. It's used as a vegetable, but like the national dish of Jamaica is Aki and saltfish. Um, and that is from a tree that was brought here from West Africa, um, carob. Um, people have seen that in Puerto Rican markets, the pods. Um, carob is a type of chocolate that's also from Africa. Right. From right. Um, tamarind, the tamarindo drink that yes. pretty much every Latin American country makes. It's like our universal thing. There's like no Latin American place you can go to without seeing tamarindo. But that is from Africa. There's no other place in the world that tamarind is native to. 
but West Africa and North Africa. And it was brought to India and people a lot of times get confused and think that tamarind is native to India because Indians love that spice too, but it's actually, it's native to Africa. Um, Africans and Indians like from East India had a lot of trade routes with one another um, that were a lot stronger than um, say the European trade routes for a while. Um, that's another reason probably that people have debated on about colonization is that like Europeans wanted a direct route to the spices and the Africans were pseudo like the middlemen for a while. They were the ones with the civilizations and stuff. So that was, they wanted to nix that out and get a straight India route. Mm -hmm. So how about, how about fufu, like fufu and pupusa? So pupusas are Native American, but um, hudut, um, which is a soup in Honduras by the Garfuna is definitely West African based. Mufungo, if you're Puerto Rican or Dominican, that is West African based. Um, and you can find similar versions to that in Cuba. Um, fufu is, it's made from a starch. What you need is a starch. Um, so originally Africans used plantains, which came out of um, Papua New Guinea. All bananas that Africans have and plantains came from Papua New Guinea um, and were brought to Madagascar and then into Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa in like really ancient times. And the highland, um, I think it's called Manitoke, is the African word for it, is a very special plantain that only grows in East Africa. And scientists are currently researching it for its special properties, but that's used in fufu making. Um, cassava, cassava or manioc is now used in West Africa, um, but that was brought from the Americas as a Native American food from Central America, now also used for fufu. Um, the original fufu, like the first starch that was ever used was from false bananas and from um, African white yam, which you can find African white yam in a lot of Caribbean markets. You can, shoot, you can find it in the Southeast in um, Harris Teeter. I saw it the other day in Food Lion. Um, in the tropical section, they had the African white yams. They were from Costa Rica and ported. Um, so those are what you use for making fufu. You pound it. Of course, like African women, they have the really huge mortar and pestles. Those women probably have some really good arm muscles. <laughs> they don't probably need the gym. <laughs> um, but um, some people at home, like they recommended using like a high powered blender if you're trying to make fufu at home. Um, because it can stick. I know because I tried making it at home and tried adding water, which didn't turn out so well. So you need like a good high powered blender to make fufu at home in like your modern day kitchen without like the big mortar and pestle, unless you wanna, you know, make one yourself, but. Oh, wow. um, so I'm transitioning into um, palm oil. The beach wine, that's what you were talking about last time we talked? Yeah, so there is, um, so around the world, um, there's a thing called palm wine. Um, every tropical country in the world has palm wine. Um, since ancient times, possibly even prehistoric times. I mean, it's one of the oldest wines in existence. Um, palm wine is considered like a sacred wine to a lot of peoples because it has over 20 different vitamins in it, scientifically, what we know. So it has what we call healing properties. Um, it is a white colored wine that looks like from whatever species it's from, it looks similar to pina colada mix. Um, there's four different ways of extracting it. When Africans came here, they brought their techniques that are passed down to this day orally from generation to generation with how to extract palm sap. And palm sap is a cool thing because you can make sugar out of it. Um, you can make syrup out of it, but it ferments within less than 24 hours if you don't freeze it um, or drink it instantly. It's instantly, unlike other trees that you tap, it's sweet. You don't have to boil it for it to become sweet. It just is automatically sweet. And a lot of children, like in Africa, will drink it. It's like a sweet dessert drink. And women like it as well, too. But it turns into moonshine, they say, or wine after about eight days of oh, fermentation. Wow. So very quickly. Um, there's different types of palms. Some debate that Jesus might have drank date palm wine based on the fact that some of the oldest palms in Jerusalem that they were able to replant recently are dates, which grow in the desert and dates are more available for the common folk and the poor people. 
Um, dates are also very big in West Africa and date palm wine is big there. Um, as well as toady like and um, palmyra palms. Um, the type that we have in Central America that people like to tap a lot are um, the K.O. wine, um, which starts with a C, C-O-Y-O-L, also called beach wine because basically the rumor has it that it has a chemical reaction, you get drunk off of it, you think you're coming down from it, but you go into the sunlight and it has a chemical reaction with your skin which makes you drunk again. Um, so that's why they call it beach wine. People extract it different ways. One way that you'll see people extract it, which is not the best, um, is cutting down the tree and carving uh, like a hole in the tree trunk and then burning each end of the tree. And so then all the sap and juice goes into that hole and you scoop it out with, with a, um, a ladle or um, a cup. Um, and usually one tree will produce about 10 gallons of juice if you do it that way. Some people do it where it preserves the tree more, which is like smarter. Well, they like different trees require different extraction. Like um, the oldest documentation we have of saw palmettos being used, like was in the Bermuda Triangle in the 1600s called Biddy, which you can look online and see. And, the, and it's also in the Caribbean uh, museums. Um, Africans were known, document, it was documented that Africans were the ones that extracted the um, sap from palmetto palms in the Bermuda Triangle. Mm -hmm. And that technique, they usually chopped off the tops and then scooped out the sap or would tap it really low in the trunk. Like the stem of the, of the yes, tree? the stem, yeah. Um, so that, um, and you can see some of that on like YouTube with some people doing that. Um, but before YouTube and everything, it's just orally. And a lot of these forms of extracting palm sap around the world, it's not written down. It's only recently that people started YouTubing it and then translating it into English via YouTube videos. There is no written book that I know of or have ever seen on palm tapping. But it's done in India. It's done in, by Native Americans in Central America. It's, and it's done by Africans, definitely, are very well versed in that. Um, so that's something that is part of a big part of um, West African medicine is that sap, believe it or not. Okay. Um, so let's go into the sugarcane beets and coffee. So coffee is North African. Um, we would not have coffee if it wasn't from Ethiopia and Eritrea, which is Northeastern Africa. Um, it's bordering like near Somalia which Somalia, if you guys know Kenya, there's like Kenya, Somalia, and then Eritrea, um, and Djibouti, and Ethiopia. And um, then you have it, you know, further up, you have Egypt. Um, so Ethiopia is known for having coffee ceremonies. Um, coffee in North Africa is considered like, if you've ever heard of a Japanese tea ceremony, where it's like a, a pseudo sacred tradition, that is immersed in like a spiritual sense. That is what coffee is to North Africans, especially Ethiopians. Um, coffee was transported in the Middle East a long, long time ago through Yemen, um, which at one point in time, Yemen was part of, people have heard of Queen of Sheba, part of Queen, the Queen of Sheba's empire, um, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Yemen. So that's the first place in the Middle East that it went out of Africa, and then the rest of the Middle East. Um, coffee really entered Europe for a while, it was banned in Europe. It was considered like the devil's drink in the Middle Ages, but it actually spread via um, Italian colonization. So the Italians colonized Ethiopia. Unfortunately, Ethiopians were able, the Ethiopian army, to um, fight against the Italians and win for many, many years. But at one point in time, the Italians were successful and colonized Ethiopia. And during that time period, Italians, like, they fell in love with Ethiopian coffee um, and they brought it to Europe and they made it into frappuccinos, um, cappuccinos. That's why you have all these Italian names for a zillion different drinks. Mm -hmm. This is the colonization period. Um, Africans do not add milk to their coffee or sugar. Um, they like, like just a pinch of salt in their coffee because it actually takes out the bitterness and 
deepens the notes that are caramel in the coffee. Um, Africans will also sometimes put a little bit of butter or um, cardamom, a certain species of cardamom in their coffee as well. Um, West Africans like grains of saline, which is similar to black pepper. Um, North Africans like uh, birds, bird of paradise, which is similar to black pepper. They're two different species of plants. Um, I think the West African one with the um, grains of saline is called um, tubo coffee, if I remember correctly. Um, but coffee is a diuretic. It speeds up your metabolism. Um, it also gives you energy. And Africans traditionally used coffee. They would grind it up sometimes into the world's first energy bars for long voyages. They would mix it with fat or ghee, which is a really good clarified butter. It's really good for your health. They pound it into balls and take little pieces of it on voyages for trade routes to India and to Europe and other places. Um, and that's been since ancient times. Um, so as you know, coffee is big. Every Latin American country, like especially Colombia, um, Hondurans, Nicaraguans, um, Haitians, Dominicans, like it's, it's a thing from colonization, Spanish also liked coffee. And so that was one of the plantation crops that were brought from Africa. Um, other things that were brought from Africa were the aloe drink. Okay. I sound like a stereotype, but there's rarely a Latin market that you do not see the, the aloe drink and like that's usually grape flavored, you know, the stereotypical, or sometimes they'll have little chunks that you're chewing on. And aloe drink comes from ancient North Africa and has been a favorite for anti-aging by Egyptians and pre-Egyptian times. Um, people use it to actually lowers your body temperature just like a watermelon does. Okay. So in your, if in a hot climate, you want your body temperature to be cooled off. You don't wanna have a inflated body temperature, which happens if you eat carbs and meat. So aloe is a way to one, keep your body temperature down. One, mosquitoes hate aloe vera. They do not like to bite people who have aloe vera on. Um, I kind of have a theory that it might actually kill mosquito larvae because we know that cactus leaf juice, when you mix it with water, actually kills mosquito larvae. Mm -hmm. So mosquitoes hate cactus juice. Um, aloe is one of the few succulents of the old world. Um, and it helps with burns. It helps with abrasions. It helps hydrate your skin. If you have it in your hair, I put it in my hair when I go in the ocean. It prevents it from breaking. It makes it soft and shiny. Um, it's also anti-disinfectant. You can use it for shaving, which I do. It doesn't dry out your skin. I use it in place of soap for my shaving myself. Um, it's also a deodorizer, so it prevents smell, like you smelling bad. Um, so there's many different uses for aloe. Um, another thing that it helps from what things it helps prevent with wrinkles. So that's why like women, Egyptian women really like it is like it helps with anti-aging and firmness in your jawline and around here and helps with, I put it on my eyes in the morning because it helps with puffiness. It takes out inflammation. And if you put it on your lips, it gets rid of the wrinkles in your lips. So that's, it's, aloe is one of the huge superfood. Um, if you have gastrointestinal issues and or chronic um, things like from trauma, if you've been to have PTSD or things like that, which are associated with IBS and gastrointestinal issues, aloe vera is one of the best things that you can drink because it actually regulates di preventing diarrhea and also constipation. It's like an e equalizer for your um, digestive tract. So like definitely our ancient ancestors, they knew a thing or two about healing themselves. Um, for centuries, they passed down these techniques um, beets. Everyone's like a superfood beets. That's a new trend. Everyone sees mm -hmm. that. That is a North African food, um, just like lettuces. We would not have lettuce, and there's not all these diet trends of lettuce. Salads, eat your salad. Um, you have it on your tacos. You have it in your, like, there's really something that does, like your lettuce wrap for low carb. Lettuce also lowers your body temperature as well, and that is a North African thing. You, if you didn't have North Africa, you wouldn't have lettuce. And you wouldn't have beets. Um, beets are really good if you're like vegan, vegetarian, especially if you're trying to get your iron levels up if you're anemic. Um, and there's actually even mythology that's with beets. 
if you know Egyptian mythology and the story of Hathor and Ra and the story of Sekhmet, those gods and goddesses, um, there's a story that's very old um, that involved beats. Um, so in Egyptian mythology, some people, there's different versions slightly of it, but one of the versions is of um, something to do with, if I'm, again, I'm not well versed in this, but um, there's a story that I heard when I was a kid that where Ra was Hathor's wife and Ra was the sun god. Um, and I he was a bird of prey. I'm not sure if it was a falcon or a hawk. You probably know more of this than I do. But um, I think he, Horus was the hawk. So I think he might have been, Ra was the falcon, if I remember correctly. And Hathor was the goddess of fertility and love and music and light. And she was his wife. But people were not being very nice to Ra and they stopped believing in him. And the humans were getting lazy and they weren't giving um, tribute to the temples um, for all of Ra's creations. And so Ra was getting really upset and, you know, men vent to their wives. And so he vented to Hathor and Hathor was like, you know, she's got super mama bear and super protective and was like, you know what, I'm going to handle this. And he's like, no, no, don't handle this. I got this. And she went ahead and handled it. She changed herself into a lion. A giant lion and she went from being this loving soft cow nurturing thing that is just love and light to completely polar opposite um the warrior goddess um goddess of vengeance goddess of the royal line of the pharaohs and just started eating people just going to town and then Ra like started getting horrified because okay that's a little much okay they learned their lesson they learned the lesson take it back a notch um, so, but she wouldn't, she was just like, so like, I'm going to get everyone that I was like, okay, we, we have to figure out a plan. So they tricked Hathor into stopping by making beer. Beer is very much based, especially barley beer in North African culture. Um, and in fact, beer is so much, we'll go into beer in a little bit, but anyway, they put the beer and they colored it. Um, further red with beet juice so it looked like blood so she drank tons of it thinking that it was human blood when it really wasn't she got drunk fell asleep and then she became the loving Hathor again um so that's one part of mythology that you literally see beats or in that and to celebrate Hathor in her festival every year at um there's a temple called Den Dendera the temple of light in Egypt, they would celebrate every year with beets. That's part of this festival, beet juice, beet foods. Um, so a lot of our, a lot of the foods, like I said, food is tradition and food is also spiritual. Um, and it also heals people. Um, beer was also a big thing in North Africa, but pre-Islamic times. Um, honey beer called Tej in North Africa and it's probably called something different in West Africa or maybe something similar um it's still drank by people even though there's a high prevalence of is Islam nowadays um but beer was like you know you hear about Italians having wine like it's a part of every part of their culture even children drink wine and back in ancient times having an alcoholic drink was a way of keep it water was not always clean so like italians would mix a little bit of wine in their water mm -hmm. as kind of it was served as an ancient um concentrate that would not just flavor your water slightly but also to kill all the bacteria in it in fact italian soldiers would drink something i think called sipa s-i-p-a which is with um red wine vinegar for their soldiers they put a certain portion in the water um to make sure that the soldiers could drink non-contaminated water um for and wine was actually included in part of your taxes your tribute that you had to pay and your employees it was not just in cash it was also in wine for africans it was the same thing but instead of wine which north africans did have wine 
mostly palm wine and so only the wealthy had the red wine. Like you see the pharaohs with grape wine because it was hard to grow in the desert. Um, so dates were more a thing and then beer was essential to Egyptians. Beer you had for breakfast, you had for lunch, and you had for dinner, and you would even eat beer. Children would eat it with bread and bowls. Um, and including an ancient Egyptian taxes to pay your employees, it was required that you had to pay them in part, a portion had to be in beer and a portion had to be in money. Um, so you see that in most written texts, beer and money with paying anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they had straws, some of the world's first straws invented for beer because they didn't filter the grain like barley, which Africans have a few different types of barley. In the Northern end, you have um, African black barley, which is strictly only native to Egypt, Egypt and Ethiopia. It doesn't grow anywhere else in the world. It's only native to those zones. So let's go get to the last one because I know that you just got out of work. Um, yeah. And I want to thank you again for doing this video. Okay. Um, oh, el coco. Where did it originate from? You said cocoa? Yeah, coco. Ch uh, chocolate? From the, from the actual palm tree. Um, so coconuts, um, coconuts are... There's two different migration of coconuts. Um, what we used to say is that the Spanish brought coconuts to the New World, and then a Spanish ship crashed and a bunch of coconuts washed ashore to Florida, and the Native Americans liked it and propagated it. What we think nowadays, and is probably what is most likely true, is that coconuts came to the Americas before Spanish colonization. Um, Australians and Polynesians had pre-Columbian trade with South America. That's a known fact. Um, if you look at migration of sweet potatoes or pineapples, um, that's, and even chickens and, or just a lot of archeology span evidence to support that. But from what we know from coconut genetics is that coconuts, um, there's one strain that came out of India and the Pacific Islands, like around Australia. And then there's another strain that came from another area from the old world. Um, so there's two different um, coconut varieties. Um, so coconuts, they are not native to Central America, but they've been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and coconuts we use for a lot of different things, our coconut milks, um, our coconut puddings, our cocoa bread, um, our soups that are seafood based in Central America, coconut, um, our cookies, there's tons of stuff, macaroons that we use coconut with. Um, so, you know, like coconut is a big thing, pina colada, um, it's tons of stuff. Um, coconut oil has been used for a long period of time. Coconut oil has its own different properties. Um, I use it on my skin myself. Um, it helps protect your skin from a lot of different things. It also is a lightening agent. Mm -hmm. People use it for whitening their teeth and also it prevents you from having morning breath. If you use it after brushing your teeth and swallow a little bit of it, in the morning you don't have morning breath. So it's a deodorizer as well and it kills bacteria, which is why like a lot of people will swig it, not just rub it on their teeth or put it in their under eye section to lighten dark circles. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if you like your freckles, it does get rid of freckles to some extent. Um, but if you are sunburned or something like that, it does take away the redness out of it. So that's something that um, coconut oil has multiple purposes. It also helps your ends from breaking if you're trying to grow out your hair. Or if you're about to get in the ocean, it prevents your hair from drying out and frizzling. Um, so that's one thing. But yeah, whitening your teeth was a big thing and keeping your mouth fresh and killing bacteria um, was a big thing for why people use coconut oil. Um, coconut water has tons of electrolytes. It's like the ancient form of Gatorade, why people drink coconut water. Um, it also has high levels of potassium. And we like potassium because it helps us from having cramps in our muscles. Um, 
so it's kind of an essential thing and it coconuts traveled for long journeys um so that's another reason if you are out at sea for a long period of time and you are dehydrated it hydrates you i mean think of gatorade we use it for athletes so it's that's basically our equivalent of that um coconut meat has its own properties as well every part of the coconut is used for different things mm -hmm. including even the leaves people some people use it for making mats and jewelry or clothing or even what i've seen recently people are using it for making coronavirus masks <laughs> that is a thing right now <laughs> yep so you know it's um coconuts are very much like it's been around for a while in african culture um in Papua New Guinea and in India, Australia, and Southern Asia. Um, that's where it originates out of, um, to the New World. Um, so we have different things that we use. Um, obviously, people do use coconut oil a lot. Um, palm oil, that's a African thing. So if you use that um, or see that in the grocery store, that is specific to Africa. Um, actually, ancient Egyptians grew fields of palm oil. That was a thing that was specific since ancient times. Um, back then, I think human labor wasn't as big for that. Believe it or not, it's going to sound crazy, but baboons were the ones that gathered fruit and things like palm oil nuts for Egyptians and ancient Africans. Um, of course, PETA would be all over that nowadays, but <laughs> I'm like, that's something that was what they use what they had. Um, and it's actually pretty smart in certain ways. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's originates out of Africa. There's no other place that use, uses palm oil that I know of um, in that way. All right. So let's um, finish up here. Um, Sherry, thank you so much for taking the time on your busy day to make this video and very informative. Um, we're going to have a future video, hopefully. Um, and uh, I want to say uh, once again, happy Mother's Day to everybody and to you, Sherry and to everybody that's going to watch this video. Um, we're closing. Have a good one, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>